Hello and welcome to podcast 25 from Football Alanya, available to you to listen and download on YouTube, SoundCloud and iTunes. Thanks listeners for being so patient in waiting for this newest podcast and if you're new, we hope you enjoy your stay with us. This time, I, Michael Statham, am joined by fellow writer James Rowe as we discuss in depth the title race and star players of a Dutch Eredivisie, as well as answer your questions that were sent in via Twitter. James, how have you been? I've been well, thank you. How have you been? Yeah, no, good, good, good. Um, have you been enjoying the Eredivisie title race this season? Yes, I have. Um, I expected um, Ajax to eventually mar- um, mount a challenge after a, a difficult start, given the circumstances with Nori and inexperience of um, of Marcel Kaiser. But I also stated before, as football and your listeners will know, that Koku is under pressure this year to deliver. And, uh, you know, he's only won two league titles in the five years that he's been in Eindhoven. And one of them was a gift for my ex's failure to beat the Graafschap on the final day. And uh, if he doesn't win the title this year, I think uh, I think that's the last we'll see of him in, see of him in Eindhoven. But there's still um, half the season to go. Ajax have won five out of their last six games and they're chasing PSV down slowly but surely. But there's a long way to go and many, many a twist and turn ahead. Yeah, and it, it's getting close at the top because PSV worked up that excellent advantage of 10 points at one point over Ajax. RZ are there as well, um, with Ajax at the top. But do do you think that um, do do you really think that Ajax can chase PSV now? Do you think they can really overtake them? Obviously, a long way to go. But when you think about it, only sixteen games. You know that five point gap. Can PSV maintain that? Do you think? Um, I think Ajax will chase them down slowly but surely. I can't see them um, getting ahead of PSV within the next month to six weeks maybe i think i think round about the winter break maybe march april time that will be when things get as tight as possible but a lot can happen between between that time both teams are not in european competition that will play a factor uh difficult away games ahead for both teams both ix and psv and you've also got down at the bottom, you've got uh, Nak Breda and Sparta Rotterdam and FC Twente all fighting for their lives. So when they come to uh, to play these teams, they'll, uh, they'll give them a right go and there may be some surprising results to be had. Yeah, and I, I'm just looking ahead actually at the fixtures in the future. 15th of April, towards the very end of the season, PS3 at home to Ajax. You know how key that could be when we get there. And um, this actually brings me to our first Twitter question of uh, the podcast from David, and do you actually think Ajax can overhaul PSV? With Locardia injured, is Luke de Jong the right man to fill the void, or do PSV need to invest in January, only next month, to ensure they remain on course for the title? Um, I just want to offer my opinion on this, because you think, James, that Ajax will catch up with PSV, and I I think so too. Um, I tipped Ajax at the start of the season, however that was before Davison Sanchez left the club, um, which surprised me, I thought he would stay. And since then, there has been a bit of defensive uh, instability. Um, injuries haven't helped. But when you see a back three of uh, Defosio Zayfalk, uh, Matthias De Ligt, and Mitchell Dykes, there's a mixture of players that aren't first choice um, and almost down to bare bones in terms of youngsters as well. Very young players. De Ligt's only 18, of course. Um, I, I actually like to offer more of my opinion on De Ligt, maybe a little bit later. But I just think that... Ajax are getting the results with that um, that stringent defence, and it's their attack. You know, Neresh, Klavert, um, and you've got uh, Huntelaar with Dolberg. They're both competing to be the first choice striker. It's it's very tough to get into that team at the minute, uh, and goals are coming from all over the place. And I just don't see how you can't back against Ajax at the minute. Is there a case for PSV though? Yeah, I think there is a case with PSV with qualities such as Lozano and Van Ginkel and Arias as a defender. Um, but I think PSV would be wise to invest in January and not necessarily over rely on uh, Luke de Jong for the goals. They they expect an awful lot of um, of uh, uh, having Lozano and he's uh, he's delivered so far. But I just I think at PSV I, I just think that the the pressure will tell as the season goes on. The pressure will tell, in particularly on Philip Koku, 
um, they would be wise to invest and it will be uh, interesting to see what they do personally from a a personal point of view, I would like to see more of Bart uh, Ramsala. I've championed his ability and his skills for many, many months on football and yeah, and um, on previous podcasts. I think he's a tremendous player. And uh, PSV, they did an absolutely wonderful piece of business trying to get Ramsala for five million euros from Utrecht. Uh, Utrecht was silly not to uh, not to ask for fifteen at the very least, but I suppose that was that was inexperience. But um, I think they'll be two in and fro in, and I, I think it will go between those two, and um, it'll be interesting, uh, interesting times ahead. Yeah, he's a terrific young player, Ramsala, and but he's one of one of the attacking talents at PSV, and I just think defence is still a bit of an issue for them. There are some good individuals. Jurgen Zut is one of the finest keepers in the league. Arias had a great season at right back when he's had his doubters. Uh, maybe it's the tactics that Koku is employing. Um, when I watched PSV away at Groningen, they had a three-one lead. They didn't hold out. They 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 drew three-three. Last-minute equaliser, defensive errors, scrambles in the box. The the P- PSV ended up playing quite defensive towards the end of the game. Substitutions were led that way as well. Um, I'm not saying they need to go out all out attack to try and score four, five, six to try and win the match. But there needs to be a bit more pragmatism about it and not just let's sit deep because it, it didn't work and it hasn't worked each time they've tried to defend. I just think when I watch PSV away from home, they're not as strong. They're not as uh, fluid in attack, understandably so perhaps, but they just let the pressure onto them so much and it invites opportunities. I remember when they got a lucky 2-1 win away at Excelsior uh, last month and it only took some fine sa- saves from Jürgen Zut to keep them into th- in the match. Um, they would have probably lost that match another day. Uh, I just think they're relying a little bit too much on luck and it's not the way forward for them and it will tell eventually and that's why I think Ajax will catch up. Well, I, I agree. I can see Ajax catching up. As I stated um, earlier on in the podcast tonight, I, I can't see that happening in quick succession in terms of a few league games. I think it will happen over the course of... Uh, uh, maybe a couple of months slowly but surely and uh, like um like a long distance runner going down for the ho- for the home straight and seeing his opponent tire and uh, and giving a little bit of gas to get himself over the winning line i can see ajax using that as a pattern and um seeing that as an impulse to uh to go forward to uh to lift the of his title again yeah absolutely uh this perhaps leads us on nicely to our next couple of questions which ask a very similar theme um James, what do you think about these then? So Gareth asks, will Ajax be able to keep this young and exciting team together long enough to establish Ajax as the top team in the Netherlands? And Eamon uh, also asks a very similar question uh, about Ajax having a good set of players, maybe one or two additions needed, but are the club ever going to stop treating the players like a shoe factory, selling off their best slash latest pair? Or will they sense and resist the temptation of accepting big money? I think that's probably a big issue in today's footballing world, isn't it, James? And perhaps being a, a little fish in terms of Europe. What do you think about that? Do you think they can keep their players together? Well, to answer the first question, I think they can keep the players together purely because the players really enjoy playing with one another. I was at the game against the ODSA with a 1-5-1 and I also did the uh, translation of Kleibert's comments when he was praising uh, Frenkie de Jong and Donny van der Beek. And it wasn't just the the fact that assists were given where he could score goals. You, you could really tell, even in his voice during the interview, that he was so pleased to play with them. And they were, it was like friends playing, you know, giving uh, assists and giving passes. And, and, and more importantly, encouraging one another and, and being happy for one another when good things happen on the pitch. And um, I can see them keeping the nucleus together for quite some time. I can't necessarily see them leaving at the drop of a hat. I can understand in terms of, of transfers how how quickly things can go, but I think um, I think there's enough um, there's enough warning signs all over Europe of players that go to a, a lot of clubs and disappear into obscurity. If I can give an example of how that can go the other way and you can turn it into a positive. I interviewed um, Jeffrey Chawaleu back in October, who made the step from I said Alkmaar to Ausbrecht in Germany. Now he plays every single week in the Bundesliga, 
and he's facing many, many difficult opponents from Abu Mayang to Lewandowski to um, Dadai at uh, Hertha Hef- Berlin. And it's a really, really strong league. And he's he is so happy to be involved in it. He's so happy to to meet the challenge. And he's, he's flew a little bit under the radar. But I maintain as well that if... I suppose not just Dutch players, but any young players with uh, with good people around them. There's enough resources in this day and age that when you are approached by a club, that you don't necessarily have to say yes to the very first offer, as attractive as it may be. Maybe I'm a bit maybe I'm a bit old fashioned, Michael. But if you're really really good, and in this case really really young. If you continue to be consistent and continue to show your worth, the club that showed an interest in you will come back in for you. It's not as if they're going to forget about you because, or they're going to be offended because you turn them down. I can understand the other point of view where players say a lot that you know this chance might never come again, as in the case of Roy Sandrenta when he signed for Real Madrid. And um, but I just think young players in particular they have to try to find a balance. Of a, uh, of a good club for development and more importantly playing time. Yeah, two good examples of that will be Jorginho Vijnaldum and David Klaassen, two regular midfielders yes. that play for the national team, played a lot of games at the top of the Eredivisie, and made a move at just the right time. Now, our next question from Jimbo, it's related to Ajax again and one of the hardest topics at the minute in terms of Dutch football. Will Frank de Jong be a centre back in the long term, or will he end up in midfield? Um, I think he'll end up in midfield. I think if if you see the driving runs he can do, and I saw him in a pre season, well, not pre season, a mid a mid season friendly a couple of weeks ago um, at home to Borussia Mönchengladbach, and it was the majority of it was Borussia Mönchengladbach's second team with a sprinkling of first team players. I I, I looked deliberately at their following home uh, game the weekend after they played Ajax where they coincidentally I think they beat Bayern Munich and I think three players that played in the friendly against Ajax midweek played in that game and the drive that Frenkie de Jong had to really take it to one to a team that was then fourth in the, in the Bundesliga picking passes spraying passes left to right you got to remember this is a friendly game and you're up against the top-notch quality side and he was chomping at the bit and you could see the um the enthusiasm to, to run that extra mile, the enthusiasm to play a pass with the outside he left foot, he, he was, he's so composed for his age, it's, uh, it's frightening really. And I think that experienced managers uh, at club level, well, uh, Michael Kaiser is gaining more experience, but people alongside him in particular that, ha- that have more in terms of uh, advice to give. And I think eventually the new national team manager because he has such a driving force for midfield and he can pick pockets and, and find space and, and play exceptional balls forward, I think um, I think a lot of people are going to be clamouring for him to uh, to start in the midfield. Yeah, he in my opinion, he's only playing at centre-back because of circumstance at uh, Ajax at the moment. He's not a defender. Uh, he's not known for a, a, a meat tackle or winning some great headers because he's diminutive. He's quite slim as well, very young. And he's there because Dutch football allows him to play at centre-back because it doesn't have the great physical demands as such. Um, I did think they got a little bit away with it, though, at uh, the RZ at the weekend. They they won Ajax, but having De Jong at centre-back next to De Ligt, it was a bit awkward and De Ligt made the, the, the majority of that defensive work. Um, but yeah, no, I think with the back three at the minute, it almost needs to that fourth man to sit in the middle. So both the full backs can, they, they can drive forward when they want to, but also are back at a time where De Jong is driving forward. It allows the defence to be a bit tighter, just another man there to cut out play. Um, but it, it's clever though, what Kaiser has done actually. It, it, it kind of took me by surprise that he did something like that and had De Jong in that almost quarterback role where he can run forward into midfield and just play those passes. It It's phenomenal. And I'm just glad that he's doing it now um, because some people have their doubts over De Jong and didn't think he was quite as good as Donny van der Beek when actually all along I thought he was better than van der Beek. He's a more complete midfielder, but De Jong is more, he has more quality. 
Um, he can spray those passes. He can just, he can just, his vision is excellent. I just really hope that we see him in uh, midfield in future, in in the eight role, also. Um, yeah, he's got a massive future ahead, hasn't he? Now, we have talked so much about Ajax that I'm pretty sure if you have any final fans listening, they'll be getting a bit sick of everything right now. Uh, we try to remain as uh, as impartial as possible, and we try to um, give attention to all Eredivisie clubs and also yeah. and also uh, mention UPL League clubs when relevant in terms of potential cup success or, or doing something uh, important in the UPL League. We, we try to remain as impartial as possible. Let's change topic though and, and Steph uh, has asked a very good question that comes up quite a lot on our podcasts, pretty much everyone, um, but has anything changed? What changes are under consideration from the league slash Dutch FA in regards to poor European performances this year? Well, my first reaction to that question is it's a very interesting question and uh, nice to get interesting questions every now and again. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, due to the debacle of missing out in Russia 2018, the eventual changes that were muted uh, not so long ago have kind of been swept under the carpet a little bit. Not because they're hoping that people forget about it and that it just magically changes overnight. I just think that with the um, with the fallout about what's happened with the failure to qualify for Russia, that um, they want to get their own house in order in terms of a, a new board at the Dutch FA, picking the right national team manager, and I think then and only then will they start like a, a root and branch, um, um, like a, a root and branch um, approach into looking as to what needs to be done when they have the right people in place. Mm. In my opinion, the the national team performance doesn't doesn't tie in quite as much into the league performance, um, because the league hasn't always been that strong recently. But we still had those fantastic World Cups uh, back in uh, 2014, 2010. And but what does need to change in future though is that the league still needs to be attractive for those foreigners to come to the Netherlands and excel those Dutch players. And uh, the way to keep it going is to make the league stronger. How can we do that? We don't really know. But what we can say for sure is that it's been talked about a lot, but the Belgian uh, league uh, has an interesting structure, a very different one to what the Netherlands is used to. And it was uh, toyed around with to use that in future in the Netherlands. But we've seen this year that the Belgian teams in Europe have actually performed uh, worse them the Dutch teams yeah. so maybe it's not the way forward so what you know what is this answer but at the minute I can't say a lot has been done by the FA the K and VB have been quite quiet um this season I, I've noticed in particular uh with the, the how, how poor the European teams have done so this season it was Feyenoord and Vitesse but last season we had Ajax get to the Europa League final maybe they're just thinking that it's a bit of bad luck perhaps some Dutch teams um but it is going to cost them they're going to lose a Champions League place, not this this season, but next season. So from, I believe, 2019, we'll only have one team qualifying from the Eredivisie for the Champions League. It's a very sad state of affairs for the league. And, and, it, and it does crush the hopes of the teams lower down the table because they may spend that extra little bit of money to push the, t- the team up towards the European places. But if it's not worth it anymore... Spending decreases further, less money in the league, and it's just going to decrease the quality even further. I think what they can do is uh, when all the pieces are in place and the people are in the right positions at the time for Bay, they could make it mandatory for all of the Eredivisie to play on grass because at the moment seven of the uh, seven of the uh, eighteen Eredivisie teams currently play on AstroTurf, and to quote. Klaasian Huntelaar, when he was interviewed uh, after playing this season, I think it was away in Venlo, where he stated that um, it's like playing on it's like pay, playing on concrete with a plastic film on top, and it adjusts it adjusts the uh, the mindset of the player in terms of a sliding tackle, in terms of uh, a diving header, in terms of uh, really overstretching for a specific uh, ball. Um, I don't think the Belgian mo- model would be conducive in, here in the Netherlands at all. I think when those ideas were being muted, it was more, oh, look at what our neighbours are doing. Maybe we could follow suit. 
Um, as I explained to the listeners back in May when we had the um, promotion and relegation playoffs, which uh, which some said they found quite difficult to understand, even though it was explained extremely clear, um, I think what they should look at in the future, um, I don't, this idea has not necessarily been muted, so I'll, I think I'll say it for the first time. I haven't heard anybody else say it, so I, I think I'll claim it as my own. Um, I would have... Uh, direct relegation with the last three places in the Eredivisie and then I would replace them with the a model to the English Championship where you have from the UPA League it would be in this case where you have the top two teams going automatically and the following six in a playoff we have here in the Netherlands what's called um, a period champion uh, and what that means is in a period of nine games who's ever ha- who's ever accumulated the most points and uh, has the best uh, record uh, comes under consideration to participate in the promotion playoffs and if you have a good spell in the league and you win your from um, your period title if you like but you end up finishing eighth in the league uh, you still have the right to try to go and, and play or lose your football the following season I think what might put the um, might put the mockers on uh, such a, a, an innovative decision. I think it will come down to money. But then again, the cave, the Kaiver Bay have to, if have to be, um, have to be very proactive. If a club cannot afford to go from astroturf to grass in terms of pitch and facilities, then the Kaiver Bay must find a way to help them uh, to make to make sure that it can be insured over time. If that in, in terms of, of a down payment, in terms of helping them, I think it would be good for the uh, for the long health of the Eredivisie. It's not a poor league, as we know, having watched it, having followed it for many, many years. It's certainly not poor. It's an acquired taste. It definitely has something about it. And when you gain more and more knowledge and when you see more things, and in the case of, of what I've gone on to do with interviewing players and managers, and you speak to more and more professionals, they don't downplay the Eredivisie at all. They don't speak bad of it. They don't bad mouth it. It is what it is. But it just needs a helping hand to get into a little bit more rude health, really. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, and, and the league just needs that extra little kick to get some teams to compete at the top, to worry Ajax, PSV, final. They, ca- they can spend a little bit more money, uh, but the minute a lot goes into the youth teams and... All the youth teams produce these excellent players at the top end of a league, um, which is what is you know the league is known for. It's known for its fantastic young players because all the money they spend goes into their youth system. And fair enough, it's their way of doing it. Uh, and relating to youth, youth players, um, Cam he asks, can you give a quick rundown on Ajax newcomer Perskurus? And oh, and as a separate question after that, so what can Ajax make about their new player, James? They can be very excited about him, and uh, I think they can be very excited that a uh, a competent six put, uh, six foot three centre back who's only eighteen years of age is going to forge a long term partnership with in the middle with uh, Matthijs uh, De Ligt. I can see them two in particular working in perfect unison in um, in as the centre backs for Ajax. I think not just in terms of their playing ability because they both have that. Um, I think they can complement each other really well. I think they get on. I think they'll get on really, really well, and I think it'll be a real uh, block. I think it'll be a real block going forward, and it's a fantastic bit of business for from Ajax. I think it's very sensible to loan to to sign him and then loan him back to Fortuna Sittard for the remainder of the season. I know that's quite normal in transfer dealings, but I think with the sensitivity regarding this one to beat PSV to. Uh, to Schuze's signature and, and I think Feyenoord were also looking at him to be so proactive just shows that although Mark Overmars received a lot of criticism for just taking the money and just uh, just counting the money and stacking it up that what he's always rem- what Overmars has always said when there is a good player who they deem good enough to play for Ajax they will uh, they will make their move and in this case they've made their move timed it perfectly and they can look forward to a very very um promising centre, um central defensive partnership between the uh, Matthias de Ligt and Perskus uh, in in the future 
Yeah, he's a very good defender. He's got a knack for free kicks as well, is what seems to be coming out. Um, he just he just needs to develop a little bit more, I think. Um, he needs to get some real good games into his belt for Ajax. Perhaps needs a little spell with Young Ajax. I think you're being a bit optimistic though, James. I'm not sure he's going to end up playing with Delict. I have a sneaky suspicion that Delict will be off in the summer. It would be an absolute shame if he did. I do not agree with it. I think Delict needs to stay for a couple more years to develop with Ajax. But with all the interest circling him, I think he's gonna he's actually going to be a replacement for Delict. But that's just my opinion. Um, the second part of Cam's question is, what's up with Kasper Dolberg? Uh, I would like to give an input on that. Um, he Dolberg, he has actually not been playing that badly recently. And and and, and if you don't, because he was benched for the last match, but before then, two goals in four games, and he played key roles in, 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 in beating Rhoda, in beating Excelsior. His link-up play has been much better recently. He didn't get a goal in the 8-0 demolition of Nat Breda, but again, he was he was helpful in linking up the play. Um, I think with Dolberg and Huntelaar, there's a lot of competition between the two, as I've stated already. But Huntelaar, he, he, he does pass up more opportunities. That's why Dolberg gets played as well. Um, I think teams have worked out that Dolberg isn't the strongest in the air. And that if you can close him down in a one-on-one -on -one situation, he does panic and he does tend to miss. Uh, but if you stand off Dolberg and let him play from deep, he has got very good layoffs. You know, he's he, he's he's one to get fouled quite often, so he's often a target for defenders. Um, very good at building the play with the dribbling and through balls. Yeah, he's doing some good stuff. But I think people are judging him on his lack of goals because at the end of last season he had 16 strikes and this season he's only got four and we're halfway through the season. So yes, the goals have dried up a little bit. But I think what's missing is that he just hasn't played enough games. He hasn't shown the consistency because he hasn't been trusted just that little bit long enough to come up with the goods. And I think that his run of games previous to being benched shows that if you play him and start him five games in a row, he does come up with the goods. You've just got to put your faith in him. Um, but I don't see how you can complain with Dolberg considering Ajax have, I think it's, uh, they've averaged three goals exactly per game this season in the eight, and I think that's incredible. I don't think you can improve upon that too much as an attacking unit. Um, and as I said already, Dolberg likes to build the play. You don't have to just judge him on his goals. Personally, I think that Kasper Dolberg has been affected by the deadline day f um, move which fell through where Monaco put, submitted a bid of 49 million euros. And Ajax turned it down purely on the basis they had no time to um, to secure a replacement. And I think in the case of Dorberg, although he's very happy in Amsterdam and he had a wonderful season last season, um, his scoring ratio for him was to ensure that a big European club in one of the big leagues would come in for him and that would secure his... Uh, his future and in the case of Monaco they wanted to have him it's just the timing of it meant that Ajax could not secure a replacement and I think that's still rattling around in his head a little bit where he's thinking maybe what if what you know to go to such a a, a wonderful well-run club in a, in a fantastic location in a strong league where you can um you can they might not be able to match Paddy Saint-Germain at the minute but they won the league last year OK, they've had a terrible time in Europe, but Monaco still is a huge name with a fantastic potential to improve even more. And um, I think he's just suffering a little bit of what what if. And, um, you know, as you, as you rightly said just a moment ago, he's, he's not starting every single game and Kaiser is trying to find a balance. So um, I think um, I think in the second half of the season, we'll see more of Kasper Dolberg. And um, I think we'll... It, We'll see him getting back to um, to his uh, scoring uh, stats of uh, of last season in particular. Mm, yeah, fair enough. Um, we must keep moving. Uh, Marcus asks a question: Is it possible that Peck Swaller will stay in the fight for the top three, fourth in the league? Um, so they're behind PSV, Ajax, RZ, who have been fantastic as well. Then you've got Peck, who just keeps into getting results. They're above Feyenoord, um, and rightly so. Uh, they've only lost twice this season. 
Um, and the other day they came from 2 0 down to win 3 2. Can they keep it up? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think they've got the, the attacking players for it. They're missing a striker. They still have this epidemic at the minute where Padishak is not enough. He doesn't score enough goals. They've even had to play players just tell Andan in the striker role. And they're basically a team of midfielders. That's why they've got all this technical ability. They're playing midfielders in defence and they're playing in attack. And they're suffering perhaps from a little bit of a, a lack of potency, a lack of a player who's going to be selfish within the box to put those chances away. And Because apart from that, their defence is excellent. It's one of the best in the league. And it's the, the reason why they're up there. They're keeping a, such a good defence, but they also have this magnificent team spirit uh, and all these quality midfield players that could, like such as Ryan Thomas, uh, Namli. Well, I agree with you on the defence. You know, Bram van Pola, Derek Marcellus, Dico Coppers, who was at Ajax in his youth. It's built a good base. And also, uh, John van Schip, he's had a... Um, he's, got, he's built up a lot of experience with uh, Melbourne in Australia and uh, Guadalajara. And he was also assistant to uh, Van Basten when he was in charge of the national team. So he has a lot of experience and he's kind of gone under the radar a little bit. There appears to be fantastic unity within that squad and, and a, a real squad pulling together in the same direction. Um, I can't see them pushing for top three towards the end of the season, but I can see them consolidating a place for the, um, the Europa League playoff where teams that finish between 4th and 7th, uh, providing um, they haven't won the cup or anything in between, um, play two-legged ties um, um, to pl go into a Europa League playoff. So I can see that, uh, I can definitely see um, Peck Swallow finishing uh, in the top seven. Yeah, I agree. They may fall away towards the end. I think Feyenoord, um, Utrecht, Vitesse, they're all their rivals to finish within that top seven which is where they will finish within that uh, great players I just think that they're missing a little bit of quality that's going to get them those 2 nil, 3 nil wins that would you know effectively lift them into the top three at the end of the season um, and Marcus's second question was who will be relegated will it be a surprise Twente and Honigan have had a bad season so far uh Actually, I think Twente will be turning a corner very soon indeed. Um, just like Honingen, they need to cut out defensive errors. It's not a quality problem, uh, in my opinion. I think both teams have got players that will get the goals that are needed. Um, but it's just defence. It's individual errors that are costing both Twente and Honingen places in the top 10 of the league. Um but you know, I, there, there are there are teams that are worse than them. Uh, Roda, Sparta, and Nac Breda are below, beneath both Twente and Groningen. I think Veve Venlo will be dragged into it as well. Perhaps Excelsior. Um, there are weak teams in the league. What's your thoughts, James? Well, as football and your listeners would know, I was never convinced of Alex Pastor's ability at Sparta Rotterdam. He was sacked after the seven 0 defeat to final yesterday. And depending on who Sparta get, if Sparta Rotterdam get a, a good manager in with good quality, they can give themselves half a chance of staying up. If they don't do that, then my decision, for, my prediction for di direct relegation would still be Sparta Rotterdam. Uh, as regards to the relegation playoffs, you're looking at Roda, Yese, Nak Breda. Uh, as much as I've eulogised about Molly Stein and Faith um, Faith, I can see them getting dragged into it. But by the same token, I still think, I think they'll they'll fluctuate. But I, I can see them avoiding the relegation playoffs. And you've also got um, Excelsior as well, who have lost uh, five of their last six games. So it's going to be very interesting at both ends of the table. But I think in the case of the the, the question that. The manager of FC Twente, Gert Jan Verbeek, has an awful lot of experience in the past with Feyenoord, Arsenal, Heerenveen, and um, and also Ernest Faber at Groningen. I know he's been um, very hot and cold, but he ha he definitely has something about him. I mean, this is a this is a man that when he was in charge of NSA Nijmegen a few years ago, they were playing some absolutely scintillating football, and he got them to ninth in the league. And on a very very small budget as well, so they both have something about them. I I can see, uh, 
I can see FC Twente and Groningen not taking part in the relegation playoffs. Yeah, I think the bottom three will be, as it is at the moment, Nat Breda, uh, Sparta Rotterdam and Rode Yese. I do think, though, that either Sparta or Nat will be in the, the 18th place, that finish bottom and be directly relegated. Um, but yeah, I think those three teams have just not got enough quality to remain in the league. Uh, final question comes from Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Um, he says that he's just come back from Eindhoven. He was at PSV Ardo. Uh, he enjoyed it. It was a great game. Uh, Arias is outstanding and De Jong is scoring again. Onwards and upwards. Yeah, he's a PSV fan. And just to say, by the way, uh, if any of you that are still listening to this podcast would like some holiday advice, uh, Jordan's a perfect example of someone that he, he came to me and, and messaged me and asked, for a bit of advice on how to get on a holiday to the Netherlands to go and watch some area to busy games. And I was so happy to help him. And I just want that anyone else that's listening who is particularly keen to go to the Netherlands, message myself, message James uh, on Twitter or YouTube, or wherever it is, just post a comment. Yeah. We're happy to answer you, happy to help you. Um, Cause yeah. it is a great holiday to have. And we have experience of some of the grounds there as well. So we know where to go, where to, where to stay in a hotel. Just let us know. Yeah. Yeah, I I, sec I I second that, Michael. I'd be more than happy to give uh, some advice to someone who did it many many years ago when I was nineteen years of age. I came to uh, to Amsterdam to watch Ajax against Arsenal in the Champions League, and I had such a wonderful time. I emigrated here two years later, so uh, I don't know if we're going. I don't know if we're going to have a spate of uh, football and your listeners doing exactly the same thing, but. Uh, it's a, it's a it's, yeah it's a, it's a wonderful experience from from top to bottom not just watching the game but the accessibility to speak to uh, supporters and, and the friendliness and um, I think many uh, football and your listeners would enjoy it but they're more than happy to to message me they're more than happy I'd be more than happy to help them if they message me or in the case of you as well for us to give them uh, fantastic advice and, and maybe advice that they're not necessarily going to hear from other parties with uh, with uh, us having the knowledge of um, of different clubs and, and different cities and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a very good plug. I'm, uh, I'm quite pleased with that. His question, though, is about Denzel Dumfries and how, how, how impressed have we been with him this season? And if he, if we think... He has what it takes to play for one of the big three in the Netherlands. Can Denzel Dumfries make it with Ajax, PSV or Feyenoord? James? Yes, he definitely can. Uh, you have often sung his praises on Twitter and quite rightly so. Yeah. Um, he's physically very... Um, he's a physical specimen. He's uh, tactically aware and uh, he could do a job for Ajax Feyenoord or PSV. But if you look at the, the openings with, with Safe Out doing so well at Ajax, I don't think there's an opening there, but there may well be for him uh, at Feyenoord or PSV. But um, you know, th this is a player that played, um, uh, made over 50 appearances for Sparta Rotterdam in a three year cycle and um, has, has hit the ground running at Hidden Vein. So he has, um, he has an awful lot of uh, potential going forward and you've got to remember he's only 21 years of age and uh, he will no doubt get better he's already been capped by Aruba twice as well and um, that's a very interesting t statistic because they play in the, in the CONCACAF region and um, yeah so that's um, for especially to be capped at such a young age and uh, I think he's got a very bright future ahead of him yeah I think he has been a bit under the radar because he's not Dutch um, he's playing for Aruba uh, instead of the Netherlands. A little bit of a shame. Actually, I'm not sure he has the quality to play uh, for a team outside of the Netherlands that's a bigger than an Ajax, a PSV or Feyenoord. But I think that maybe would be his level. But a very good player, like the same. He has very good technical ability. He's, he's strong. Um, so very good defensively as a right back. But also great on the right wing. He, you know, he helps out the, the four players there. He's very good at overlapping runs, crosses in the box. He gets involved in the box. Well, James, uh, thanks for joining me on this podcast. You're more than welcome. Really enjoyed it. I hope the listeners did too. Brilliant. We'll catch you guys soon. Make sure you like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Yes, thank you. And don't, uh, feel free to, uh, to follow and pass us any questions you wish. And uh, we'll be happy to answer them.